Every time I look in the Maybe mirror, I'm like, man, I do pants. have a ton of uh, skate shoes um, and skate gear. I've been in like these pair, like this style of shoe. <laughs> I literally have 35 pairs. It's the only kind of shoes I wear. And so like, I have all these weird patterns, like I've got birds and I've got like, I've got all sorts of I'm weird stuff. I'm a shoeholic stuff. too, but just in a very different style, I guess. Yeah, okay, oh, it's real different. That's what I love about our friendship, you and I, is that we're very different and yet we're friends and we love each other. Oh, for sure. Like I've, I've sea monsters, like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, I always have like van shoes. And so like my kids started wearing it too. Welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture, guaranteed to spice up your relationship with God. I'm your host, Stephanie Roussel, and here is today's episode. So, <laughs> Megan, tell us a little bit about you. It's so fun to have you back on the podcast, actually. You were with I'm us so glad a long to be here. time ago when you released uh, your amazing Bible study on Esther called Summoned. That was a couple of years ago. And now you're back because you have the most exciting uh, adventure that you're wanting to share with us. So before we do that, tell us a bit about you. Yes, the Vans, but like beyond that, who are you and what what is pulling at your heartstrings these days? So I am a seasoned military spouse, a mother of four and a military missionary. So my husband has been active duty military for almost 18 years. We have lived at five duty stations, over 13 houses, and I can pack and unpack a house in less than three days. It is an acquired That's skill. That's a super yeah. I've lived yeah. overseas so many times. I've moved so many times, obviously not military, but I know what it's like to have to uh, pack up your life and make it fit in however much space you have i know i know it's like we bubble wrap our dishes and maybe a little bit of the emotion stuff them down in a box and uh, we'll unpack them later uh but yeah we've been uh, military for a long time and uh we're currently stationed in south mississippi where we hope will be the last station um mississippi on the coast is the land of sand and beach tacos and i feel like this is the the place that i belong forever there's uh, so much good food and um, which is kind of the reason I wanted to retire here. Um, the Gulf Coast is an amazing culture. It's real laid back and slow. Um, so we've been here before we were part of a church plant um, a couple years back. And when we had the opportunity to pick where we wanted to move, uh, the Gulf Coast was at the top of our list. So we're back on the Gulf Coast. We're working with a church plant. We're building community with the local military community and the local civilian church. And so uh, we've been doing that for a while. And this year, 2022, um, we finally uh, signed on the dotted line and filed for nonprofit status. So the adventure I'm on right now is uh, leaning into the responsibility of being the executive director of a nonprofit called Millspoco. Yes. So before we go there, tell us a little bit about military life. You've enlightened me a lot over the last couple of years of our friendship. And uh, tell me about what it's like. And as a Christian, specifically, um, what are you hoping to to accomplish in the military community? And why does it matter? Well, my husband and I were married very young, as most military couples are wont to do. And I was actually a non-believer when we got married. I really didn't understand how to reconcile a good father, a good heavenly father with just some of the terrible things that I had experienced on this side of heaven. And it really didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and like most military spouses, we tend to find Jesus or rather he finds us um, in really dark places. And so, you know, um, my husband, who is going to be a cradle to the grave, married and buried in the church, um, when we first got married, about six months after our wedding, dragged me into a local church um, where this very stately gentleman in a three-piece suit and a wicked comb over uh, waddled his way to the pulpit. And I remember thinking, is this man okay? I mean, that's a lot of sweat for one person. And he had this really big, thick Bible in his hand, and I wasn't really sure what we were doing. Um, and I remember he says, okay, beloved, I want everybody to open their Bibles to the book of Ephesians. 
And I remember what's an, what's an aphasia? What is that? Um, I remember looking over the pew and at my neighbor and I was like, okay, it's in the back half of this really big book. All right. Is there a page number? What are we talking about? And so he finally, you know, I finally find my spot in this, you know, gift Bible I had been given at graduation. And this man begins unpacking Ephesians one in a way I had never heard it before. Uh, you'd been predestined to sonship, adopted, lavished in love, just this long list of all the things that Jesus had accomplished. And I was completely wrecked. I remember sitting in our little, you know, sedan after the service, like sobbing over this Bible. And I was like, is this for real? And I remember my husband was really excited. He was like, yeah, I've known that since I was five, but I'm super excited that you're excited. Want to go to Chili's and I'll tell you all about it. And, uh, you know, he knew the way to my heart is always going to be fajitas. So he, he took me to lunch and, and really unpacked the gospel for me. And um, years went by. I really didn't know how to read my Bible. I wasn't discipled in the church. I really didn't fit into women's ministries. Uh, but there was a season coming up that I would really meet the Lord in a real way. Um, the short story is that he got sent to Afghanistan when our children were very young. We'd been married for a, a number of years. And we had a scare where I thought that he had been injured in combat, um, injured, or, you know, I really believed he wasn't coming home. And it was in that moment where the Lord met me. Um, I learned how to pray. I learned how to lean upon him. I learned how to call upon him. Um, but really the reason I'm in missions is because when the scariest thing I could imagine as a military spouse happened to me, I thought my husband wouldn't come home. I didn't have anybody to call at the local church and I didn't know what the word of the Lord actually said. And those two things were my greatest pain point. I was in a civilian community. We were part of a church, but we weren't really invested. And we really didn't know what it looked like to live in community with God's people. I didn't have any wise older women who could say to me that, you know, our circumstances here on earth are temporary, but God himself is eternal. I didn't really have the tools and while if you would have talked to me a decade ago and said, like, is that when you felt like God called you into missions? I don't know if I could say yes then, but today I can say absolutely, you know, um, waiting for the phone call or watching for the black sedan to pull up in my driveway. I learned um, what it meant to be a, a Christian in the military space. It means that we're all supposed to live missionally. Um, I took that charge. And I ran with it. And here we are today. And I think, you know, if you're not in the military community and you're wondering what it's like, if I had to put it into words, I would say it really feels a lot like exclusion, isolation and being misunderstood. Um, we fit in somewhat to our civilian surroundings, um, but it's almost like we constantly have to wonder if people really understand how frustrating, how lonely, how isolated we are. And, and how desperate we are for redemptive friendships and for community um, within the family of God and for the non-believer um, in our space, how fundamentally um, lost and frightened that they are and how desperately they need people who have the eternal hope of Christ um, to bring it to them in meaningful and tangible ways through relationship. So how have you chosen to be the answer to your own prayer? Really, I feel like the Lord and I spent a lot of time together in the beginning. Um, you know, when I got the call from my husband that he was okay after our scare, um, while I was overrun with gratitude that he was safe and that he was going to come home, uh, I was also overcome with conviction. I had this Bible in my hand and I had no idea what it said. I had no idea how to read it. And so every night at 830, I would get myself a bowl of ice cream. If, if there's anything redemptive about the state of Ohio, it is UDF ice cream. If you don't know what that is, United Dairy Farmers has the best ice cream in the, in the North. It was delicious. So I would get myself a bowl of ice cream and I, Taste my little see, Bible, the Lord is good. Indeed. The Lord is good. Taste and see vanilla bean ice cream. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I would sit with, uh, I, I would have my little bowl of ice cream in the word. And I would think there's nothing that happened today that could not be overcome with a bowl of ice cream in the word of the Lord. I mean, like that was superpower time. 
So we would sit down and I would uh, just read. I couldn't quite study yet. I was just consuming the word um, in big chunks. And uh, right after my husband got home, we moved to Keesler, where we're at now, back in 2014. So almost 10 years ago. And I had that fresh feeling from the scare, from knowing I was alone and I was determined, no one else. So I put on our local Facebook page, hey, um, I, I know you don't know me. I'm just going to be hanging out at my house on Thursday mornings with a cup of coffee and I'm going to be reading this big book. If anybody's curious, you're welcome to come. And so that first Thursday, it was me and my, my weird neighbor and uh, a handful of women from the street. Uh, there was, um, me and my neighbor who now is one of my closest friends. We've, we've been through all the things and back these last 10 years. And, and it is a love that is just indescribable. Anything apart from the Holy spirit. Um, the Lord knit our souls together. Love that woman. And, uh, there was a commander spouse who was in her fifties. We had a 27 year old professional. We had a 22 year old new mom and an 18 year old brand new military spouse. It was all across the board, all backgrounds, all walks of life. Um, and all of us were hungry for the Lord. One week later, there were 17. A week after that, there were 25. And before I knew it, women were dragging lawn chairs down the street to get into my little bitty military issued 14 foot by 14 foot shoe box to hear the word of the Lord. And I remember joking with Jesus and being like, dude, if I'm your Bible teacher, you might have an HR problem. Like, have you met me? Have you looked at me? Like I am a mom group dropout. What are we doing? There's got to be somebody more qualified out here because at the time I had no theological training. I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that I loved the Lord and I wanted others to love him. And so uh, before we knew it, you know, we outgrew my living room and I went down to the local Air Force chapel, knocked on the door and I was like, hey, Chappie, um, I've got a problem, sir. My kitchen is a Play-Doh nightmare and uh, we can't fit in my living room anymore. There's too many of us. And they gave us the entire chapel. So um, every Thursday morning, um, every other Thursday, there were we started with 50 moms and, and about 50 kids. And before we knew it, by the time we had to close the doors, we had outgrown the funding, the government staff, the facility, and we had over 200 participants. And so it was in that moment that the Lord really showed me his vision for what he was doing. Uh, we are a training base here at Keesler. I had to train all the women who were leading Bible studies in the chapel to do it around their kitchen tables and their coffee tables from their couches. And we took big groups of 10, 12, 15 women in one group, and we made them small. We had one woman who was leading with a group of five. And then those women started moving and then they started replicating. And today we have hundreds of groups of women meeting all over the globe around coffee tables and kitchen tables with nothing but a coffee pot and the word of the Lord. It's stripped down all the way. And we are seeing revival happen in sweeping motions. And so really what I do as a military missionary is I equip women in the military community to live on mission while they're already living on mission for the Lord. So what does it look like today? And what are your pain points? So what it looks like today, um, we have finally um, shifted from just viewing this as an organic ground movement, as something that needs to be organized and intentional. You know, for years, you know, almost half a decade now, I have fought the Lord on uh, becoming uh, a nonprofit. I, you know, in the same way that I was like, hey, bro, you probably have a uh, HR problem if uh, I'm your Bible teacher here. Um, in the same way, I was like, dude, I'm definitely not uh, director material. Like, just leave me in the field. I'm fine. Leave me in the living room. Don't make me do the things. Um, and all of us who serve the Lord know that he gets what he wants when he wants it. And we're going to do it. <laughs> We've got to do it one way or the other. Um, so we finally um, submitted to the Lord. My husband and I um, had a long talk about what it would look like to build this organization. And, you know, the mission at Millspoco is to recruit, 
train and release military connected women as paid and prepared vocational missionaries. So the vision is to see revival overtake the 3 million in community, right? There's 3 million um, in the active duty uh, military community, including service members and spouses. And there is about 6 million when you include our veteran and retiree community. It is a large community. Uh, but really the vision is this. Um, we are perfectly positioned to serve God on mission as missionaries because we move every two to four years. Military spouses specifically are master community builders. We are responsible for building up homes, building up connections, uh, really learning the new culture wherever we are and engaging with it. Man, if that's not the raw skills of a missionary, I don't know what is. And if we can take the hard parts of the military community and really the hardest parts are the moving, the building a, a new life every two to four years, you know, the grief and the loss, you know, there's a joke that you can't have the job, the community and the church that you want all at the same station. You'll, you'll be lucky if you get one. You're really, really, really like the Lord has really been good and blessing if you have two, but I've never seen everybody get anybody get three. And so it's one of those things that as we build, you know, a, a life over and over again, uh, taking those pain points to the foot of the cross and asking Jesus to redeem it all, um, we can take these hard parts about the way that we live and we can give them to the Lord and watch him work within it. And that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest part for you? The hardest part for me um, one of the things that that we talk about often in women's ministry is that women's ministry is often relegated to an unpaid staff position um, or uh, they volunteer in perpetuity um, and at a pace that is not only unsustainable, but unhealthy. Um, they're usually not discipled in the same way uh, other church leaders are. They have limited access. So Mill Spoko, and for me, that was my pain point. Um, in wanting to serve the Lord and, and having a misunderstanding of what that looked like for me, I volunteered until I burned all the way out. And, and it was like, it was like the enemy was using my busyness to choke the gospel out of my life. And, uh, there was no redemptive aspect to it. It was just, you sacrifice, you sacrifice for the Lord, you do it until it hurts. And then even when it hurts until you hit the wall and you, and you may or may not recover, but the machine will keep going because they'll just put another fresh face in the spot that I occupied. And that was so damaging to me as a woman, as a believer, as a leader, that Mill Spoko fundamentally will not function on the untrained, unpaid labor of women. Um, we believe in sending them through theological education so that they can feel confident in the calling to teach what the Bible actually says. We disciple them intentionally so that they have accountability checks we teach them to support raise uh, because we believe that skilled labor is worthy of a paycheck. And we think that that is the way we make women in mission sustainable is by paying them a wage that not only blesses them and their family, it creates financial freedom. Um, it creates opportunities for them to spend quality time with their family, to outsource things. Um, and for me, I outsource a lot to, uh, to go restaurants. I don't cook as often as people probably think I should. And there's always a cup of coffee in my hand. So, I mean, my greatest pain point in serving as a missionary is that for nearly a decade, we did it with no paycheck. And my husband was cutting his check into thirds. So when we built Millspo Co., we built it infrastructurally to support women in missions with a paycheck and with an education. So walk us through what that has looked like in 2022, because I know you've 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 already you're really already in the process of launching your first women on the field, training them and everything. Uh, so tell us about what you've done in 2022, who you're training, who you're equipping and what is going to happen to them next year. Yes. So, you know, um, I, I have this like Rolodex in my head of, you know, the great conversations I've had with the Lord And we filed for our paperwork back in June and it was issued at the end of the month. Um, there were a myriad of things that happened in order to bring this nonprofit about, and it was all the Lord 
Um, and, and I'll be sharing a lot of those stories on social media throughout the end of the year. So you should, you should follow at Meg Brown Wrights and at Mill Spoko if you want to see some of these stories, because they're really great stories of how the Lord moves in spite of our fear. But um, in 2020, the, I sat down with the Lord and I was like, this is what we're not going to do. And, 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 and I'll tell you, never have those conversations with the Lord. You're always going to get put in your place. Don't tell the Lord what you're not going to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, he, he, he lovingly told me to, to sit down and start coloring and, and stop, stop being silly. But um, really, we got the vision for what we wanted this to be. We wanted it to be a mission sending organization. We wanted it to be redemptive of the military challenge. We wanted it to be relationship based and we wanted it to be partner fueled. Those are kind of the big core things. Um, we're evangelical. Um, we exist to disciple the military community. And fundamentally, we believe at Mills Boco that the difference between a well service member and an ill service member um, the difference between a lost service member, a saved service member, same with the children in our space, is a woman with the gospel, a woman who can wield the word, a woman who can live by example, a woman, and, and really this is the core thing, who has such a beautiful and, and, and redemptive relationship with Christ herself that it is so attractive that people can't help but flock to women who have experienced hope and redemption. So at our core, we're evangelical for women in the space. And uh, what we've done in 2020, we've traveled all over the country. We've done mission trips at Fort Bragg, which is, you know, the military calls it the center of the military universe. If you can do it at Bragg, you can do it anywhere. Um, it's an army station, army post. Uh, we did uh, another mission trip to Pensacola, Florida. We did trips to Washington, D.C., um, we've been all over in 2020 carrying the gospel and bringing it to this community. And in simultaneous action, we've raised up and identified 10 women who we are going to send through a certification process for all of 23. The Lord this year in 2020 really taught me personally. 2022. That, you keep saying 2020, girl. We moved to 2022. About It is 2022. Ago. You can I tell know, that 2020 was a very foundational year for me. It must have been. <laughs> So yeah, 2022, in 2022, yeah. in 2022, we really, um, I really got to grasp the difference between urgency and haste. I think sometimes as ministry leaders, we're so motivated by an end result, right? We want to see women come to the Lord. We want to see revival. We want to see leaders raised up and we want it right now because the need is so big right now. Well, the Lord really taught me this year, the difference between working with urgency, knowing that it's important and, and working in haste where I'm just throwing things up against the wall with a quickness, hoping that it'll be the solution. We're going to take an entire year in 2023 to raise up well-equipped missionaries who will raise up well-equipped missionaries. And so we're going to take a year to support raise for them. We're going to take a year to support raise with them. Um, we're going to work with our ministry partners to uh, send them through the ghost certificate. We were given um, a, a designated offering for the Brooklyn Mission Sending Scholarship that paid for 10 women outright, all their tuition, all of their books um, to get a certificate in biblical studies and theology. Um, which is a bird's eye view of all the skills they're going to need in order to do this mission well. They're all getting one year of biblical counseling. They're all getting one year of mission training and coaching with me um, so that when they do hit the field, they will hit the field as well trained, prepared, equipped women. And so that's really what 2023 is going to look like a lot of training and equipping. How about you? What are you going to, what's your heart for yourself? And then uh, for your, because your, your whole organization isn't just these 10 women. Um, I mean, I understand. I love how you're focusing on them. I think it's wonderful and I love it. Uh, but what about you in that process? You know, um, when I sat down uh, at the end of the year to kind of do strategy, not only for, you know, the women we're serving and the organization, um, I like to go to my local dollar store and I like to buy a giant um, sketchbook. They're these big, huge spiral bound, like big sketchbooks. 
And I like to write down all the names of the people that we will be intentionally working with this year. And I always start with me um, on the first page, because if I'm not deepening my relationship with, with the Lord, if I'm not seeking his face, if I'm not doing those things, then I can't even have a hope to serve the women who I want to do that. I've got to, I can't take them anywhere. I haven't been myself. And so it's so funny when I wrote my name down, um, I'm, I'm a visual thinker and, and I sort of doodled a scuba diver, right? Um, I want to dive deeply in 23 and, um, I I'm calling it the year of investment. I'm asking for my partners and ministry partners. Um, our sponsors, our donors, to invest, um, to invest in me, to invest in our community, to invest in the women that we're raising up to serve this community. Um, but specifically what that looks like for me, um, I am uh, really pouring in uh, intentionally to my own relationship with the Lord. I am dedicating time, assets, um, really, really, really intention and focus on just spending very, very much needed quality time with the Lord so that I can be the kind of leader that builds an organization that'll outlive me um, because it's not about me in the beginning anyway. Um, I, uh, I I get all excited about it, right? Like I just, I had my little scuba diver and there's all these little pictures of like the things I want to do um, and the ways I want God to meet me. And I'm asking him to make it personal. Um, there's so much going on. Um, at this, you know, season of life, I've got a, I've got two teenagers guys help. There's teenagers. In my house. Uh, and then I've got two grade schoolers, right? So I have four children and, um, I'm asking the Lord to meet me in my mothering. I'm asking him to draw my children's hearts closer to him. Um, I'm asking God to, uh, give me the skill, the language, the intentionality to, um, model to them, you know, how I want them to engage with the Lord by, by building spiritual disciplines as a family. Um, we're, we're, we've always been mission focused. We're, we've been on church planting teams and for so many years, all of it has really been about the work. Um, and my work has always been worship, writing is worship, working is worship. Um, but I'm asking the Lord to raise up our rest as worship. And I'm asking God to raise up our quality time and our relationships as worship and not just the work. So, so that's, that's me 23. Um, we're asking God to raise up, raise up some new things that worship him. Mm -hmm. Thank you for not giving an answer that was only about Ms. Spoko, because I think as women, I mean, all of the areas of our lives as wives and mothers and yes, ministry leaders, it all bleeds into one another, doesn't it? It, so, does. Um, it does. Tell us about your husband. What is it to have him home? How does that play into the freedom you now have to do Ms. Spoko? Oh, man. OK, so I'm going to brag on my husband, right? Because not, I, and, you know, it's really, really not fair sometimes that I cannot ever be mad at him for too long. I mean, the dude literally dragged me before the savior, right? Like if he doesn't do the dishes, I can't be that mad about it. Um, so my husband and I have been married. Uh, this is uh, coming up on our uh, 17th wedding anniversary. We've got a 14 year old who's about to be 15. We've got a thir almost 13 year old and then a 10, he was almost 11 and then a seven. And uh, we met at 20. We were married four months later. It was very, very quick. From the get-go of mission, my husband has not only been 100% behind it, he's really the, the man that paved the road uh, for us to be able to do this well. In the beginning, he was cutting his paycheck into thirds so that we could support missions. We were baking cupcakes out of my kitchen to buy Bibles. Um, I used to own a cake business. That's my fun fact about me. It was called Lady Face Cakes and my husband, and we called it Lady Face because that was my husband's hilarious pet name for me. I don't know where that came from. He would walk in the door. I mean, full uniform and the boots on and he would see me and he'd say, hey, Lady Face, I'm, it's good to be home. And so, you know, we sold cakes to buy Bibles. Um, you know, uh, when I came home, 
from the first women's ministry conference I had ever been to, right? He, we were, he was a tech sergeant, which, and we were single income, which, you know, meant we were broke with four kids. Um, he came home one day after I'd been to this conference and my kitchen table was covered in like 17 commentaries, like markers. I have ADHD guys. Like when I study the Bible, it's a full contact sport. And he looked at me and he's like, woman, what, what is your life? What are you doing? I said, I must know all the things about the Lord. I rewrote the book of Ephesians in the original Greek. This is amazing. <laughs> and he's like, okay, um, so when are you going to college for this? And I sort of chuckled and I was like, listen, bro, um, you're a tech sergeant and we have no money. What college with what funds? What are you talking about? Well, he came home like four or five days later and he was so smooth about it, Stephanie. Like he slid this envelope to me um, and, and I was like, what's that? And he's like, I got you something. And I was like, oh, cool. What is it? And I opened it up and he had transferred his full GI bill to me. And he was like, baby, you better go get that degree. And I mean, every step of the way, my husband has been absolutely amazing so um, in 2017, I started my degree in uh, ministry leadership with a focus in women's ministry and theology at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago online. And uh, I graduated in uh, 2021, which was super exciting. We went to Disney as a family. Um, and I'm graduating this May with my master's in nonprofit admin because my husband really believed in this and gave me his, his GI Bill. And so um, what does it mean that he's home? Uh, when I say this guy is my best friend and has been the biggest cheerleader, not only for me, but for our kids. Um, we had a really rough season. Um, in 2019, he was deployed to the Middle East. He came home maybe like two weeks before the world shut down in 2020. And then a few months into COVID lockdowns and some of the biggest stress, I'd say all of us have ever experienced, he got orders for a one-year tour that would be unaccompanied to Korea. And so doing a back-to-back -back deployment in a one-year short tour um, was difficult. And, and that's like the understatement of the year. Um, all of us, all six of us, me, my husband, our kids went through some serious anxiety, some depression. Um, you know, my husband has PTSD, so it did not help that. Um, you know, he came home and uh, when he had come home, he had been injured a week before returning home. And that injury really not only played up his PTSD, but also, you know, he couldn't drive. And so he was looking forward to this idealistic homecoming of spending quality time with the kids and wrestling and playing and catching up on two years worth of missed holidays and birthdays and significant events and milestones. Um, really, now that he is not only home, but we have laced our lives back together um, slowly doing the hard work of rebuilding all that we had lost. Um, we're in one of the best places we've been in, in the entire time we've been married because we know, um, there's a, a certainty and, and a foundation to our relationship. That's unshakable, even when everything else feels like it's falling apart. So even if everything falls, the family falls apart, the kids fall apart, the job falls apart, the work falls apart. I fall apart. Everything fell apart guys. Um, the foundation was rock solid, um, because it was Jesus himself. And now that we've rebuilt on the same foundation, we've rebuilt upon time and time before, um, there's just a certainty and a surety to our relationship that gives me uh, a confidence and a freedom to chase down some of these big things, because I know at the end of the day, you know, we ain't going nowhere. It's good. <laughs> What you just did answer. here, I don't know. Well, yeah, but what you actually just did is that you just helped the people listening who are not familiar with the military lifestyle, you just help them understand exactly what it's like that everyone goes through. And because you've been through it and you've come out, uh, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying there's not going to be challenges ahead, but I want for every single family, military family, what you just described. Not the hardship that you just described, but the hardship sounds like it's inevitable and everyone goes mm -hmm. through it, but coming out on the other side stronger and trusting in Christ as the foundation, because ultimately you are actually entering this coming season of your life with a desire 
to equip everyone with the tools that have allowed you to survive what every single military family seems to be going through, right? Yes. And, and, and really when I say the military community lives our lives sacrificially um, around the things that we believe in, right? When we say our spouses have signed up to uh, do all of these hard things, to leave the family for six, nine, 12, 15 months, sometimes very little communication in between. Um, the, the spouses in the space, um, the, you know, I say that phrase signed up, that's usually the one that gets thrown at us the most, like, oh, you knew what you signed up for. I guarantee none of us did. I think we had some idea that there would be, you know, challenges and deployments and things like that, but 20 years of combat and unceasing operations tempo, we can look around and see the, the cost of that in our relationships, in our own emotional stability, in our children. Um, we can see it in the way that we engage. We can, we can feel it and it's a daily thing. Um, I'll say it this way. I can feel it in my heart, soul, body, mind daily, what the military uh, and this lifestyle has taken and what it's given. Um, it's not a bad life. There are some bad days, but I can say with certainty that um, one of the reasons the military community is so tight knit is because we have a shared sacrifice and we have shared sufferings. And so um, I was talking with a, a friend of mine the other day. Um, she was asking me what it is like to deal with back-to-back -back deployments. And, you know, I'm not an anomaly, right? Um, we had two back-to-back. -back. I have a friend who's done seven in the last 10 oh, years. Wow. I... And uh, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, a lighter, a, you know, this is pretty manageable when you look at some of the grand scheme of things, especially when you get into like spec ops or special operations communities. Um, if you want to, they call them steel magnolias, those women. Um, but I'll, I'll say it this way. Um, when we look at what this costs, um, the highlight reel of the hardships over the last two years for me and two years for me, um, my son um, spent his birthday without his dad for two years in a row. And the first year I thought, we'll just distract him. We'll go to Great Wolf Lodge. We'll spend a bunch of money and we'll, we'll just try and make it work. Even with that, he cried for eight hours, solid. And, and the next year we were dreading it. We were like, okay, it's another birthday. Dad is not home. We're going to have to do it again. Let's do it again. And again, solid eight hours. Um, some of the things when he came home, all four of my kids asked me, does dad still love me? He doesn't, he hasn't been able to talk to me. Like even when they're gone, the time difference isn't really something you think about. But when you think about, you know, where he was at was 15 hours in the future. So the only time we could talk was five minutes when either we are getting up first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. or when he's going and when he's going to bed or vice versa. And maybe a 10 minute call on Saturday because, you know, he's working shifts. And so when you think about the massive amounts of disconnection and what that actually does to a family, how much more uh, do we need the local church? How much more? You know, um, I, I talk about the hardships, but do you know my favorite thing, Stephanie, after, after he leaves, like the first thing that I look forward to is that first good church lady hug, right? Like I can't overemphasize the importance of the church lady hug. And if you are a local church member, this is for you. Um, so when I drag myself to church for the first time after he's gone, right? Like I've done the morning routine with four children, getting him out the door. Only half my makeup is on. I forgot my mascara and I look sort of crazy because I only put on like half of my makeup on one side of my face before it was time to leave. And one of my children has no shoes. And the other one is like making a beeline for the donuts and has like six donuts in their hand, right? Like, <laughs> We're a whole vibe when we come to church, Stephanie, there's, there's a posse of us. But when that one lady who knows us makes eye contact and sees me and makes a beeline for me and gives me the first adult hug I've had in a week, there's something so redemptive to that. Um, when a woman from the local church shows up with my favorite cup of coffee, y'all, I don't even care. Pumpkin spice for life. I love it. A, a good PSL with oat milk is, is my jam. 
And so it shows up with my coffee. If I miss it and she calls me and she's like, Hey, you weren't at church this morning. You're always at church. What's going on? How are you doing? Or man, for the love, just women that have dropped by the house and said, Hey, um, we're not going to say, call us if you need anything. What do you need today? Like, this is how, you know, this is, this is the hands and feet of Jesus stuff. And so um, all of that to say, you know, the sacrifice is big, but the way you step into that sacrifice can be small. It doesn't have to be big stuff. The sacrifices are big. Yes. But the way to serve the military community is actually really small. Um, very simple. Um, and, and man, as evangelical Christians, the best thing you could ever give anyone, especially someone who is in a community that steps into harm's way is to give them the gospel, um, as a first importance issue. And that's really what I do as a military missionary. That's what I advocate for in the local church. Um, we believe that our community, the military community belongs in this family because we think that God has grace and peace for them in you listener. We love you. We need you. I think it's one of the things you've done for me over the last couple of years is open my eyes to the reality of military life uh, and then to the incredible un unknown and in my world unseen uh, needs that the military community has for Jesus. And it sounds so obvious when I say it. And, you know, it just you, you have I think the Lord has gifted you with the ability to um to bridge a little bit of that gap by having the ability to be a storyteller and to explain to the regular people, to what you call the civilians, even though I'm not a huge fan of that term, but I hear why you're using it. Um, Cause it sounds like you're creating a distance when actually you're not, but uh, the, the you're, you're telling us what it's like, and I'm not even an American citizen. So it's like, add that whole layer to it, but that's different. Um, because military is military anywhere. I have to believe the French military is the, has the same struggles American military does. And so um, all this to say, I think for our listener, if you're interested in, if you're intrigued and you're like, oh my goodness, yes. Did Megan just say there's 3 million active military people in the States and overseas? Did she just say total 6 million people? And I don't think she even counted the children. Or maybe you did. I don't know. Uh, but my point is that's nope. a lot of people. And that's a lot that's of people, a whole lot of people. And like, we just don't think about it on a daily basis, but we absolutely should because we're part of the body of Christ for those who are believers. So thank you for the couple of tips you've given just the regular people like me to how we can love on the military community that attends our church. Uh, and then more specifically, let's say there's someone who's listening and he or she is like, okay, I'm beginning to see that there's a whole lot of people I had not seen. And I can see that someone like Megan is actively in the trenches, reaching a people group who are my brother and sisters in Christ or who are called to be. Um, how can I be a part of this? What can I do? I'm not going to start baking cookies in my kitchen. I'm not going to start. Uh, I mean, I can start hugging people at church, but like, Megan, what can I do? How can I help? So one of the biggest things you can do if you want to learn more about what we do and how you can be part of the story is by downloading our app. One of the things that our app does for us is it creates connectivity across all of these different locations. And in our app, there's a lot more of our story. Uh, there's a way to give. I mean, really the big three ways to be part of the movement with Mills Foco and military missions is through prayer, giving, and sharing. And what I mean by that is, man, one, I would like everyone to pray for revival in the military community. When you think Before about I stop you right there, if you're listening to Gospel Spice on a regular basis, we do the exact same thing. I mean, we call people to pray Gospel Spice Forward, play Gospel Spice Forward, share it, and pay Gospel Spice Forward. It's the exact same three things. So we totally get it. So how can we be praying for you? Be praying that um, the civilians in our space, the, the local church, specifically the local church, would catch the vision for who we are. If you think about the fact that we move every two to four years and that we are in every lower 48 state, we're in Alaska, we're in Hawaii, we're in the middle of oceans, we're in Asia, we're in Europe, we are all over God's green earth. If you give us the gospel, it goes with us. If you read uh, the book of Acts and you see Paul, um, the gospel has always been carried by a military community. The, the, the Roman military carried the gospel. And look at the way that that impacted the known world. The gospel was everywhere. 
if you can catch the vision that there are 3 million people that are moving on a regular basis, and, and instead of seeing us as someone who is temporarily in your space, whether that is your neighborhood, your workplace, your, uh, your local church, that we are the largest mobilized and missional force this country has. And if the church would leverage that for the Lord and would invest in us, disciple us, teach us, pray with us, model Jesus for us, we will take that with us. So be praying that the local church will catch the vision for who we are and what we do. Um, the next thing is to give. Um, you know, one of the things that I said it earlier, we believe in educating and paying women for the work that we're training them to do. We, um, that takes funds. And uh, we're currently on a goal to raise $20,000 by the end of 2022 so that we can continue raising up women in our space to go through uh, our theological training, our mission training, but also so that we can get resources to the community that we need. The military space um, is about 30 years behind in resourcing. We're really disconnected from the local church. So as you can see behind me, I am a book fanatic. I love books. I love, I have a full shelf for just commentaries. I love my books, but, but women in our space don't even have access to the Bible. And one of the biggest initiatives that Mills Boco does is we provide our new Bible study participants with a beautiful Bible, a copy of the Bible study and a book that will grow their faith, either theologically um, or spiritually. And so we give them that. And these, these boxes that we give, we call them the Mills Boco Bible box launching in January. We're sending 60 of them to military spouses. Those boxes retail for over $120 but we can put them together and send them out for a hundred dollars each. So a hundred dollars sponsors a military spouse to get a copy of the scripture. One day I was teaching a Bible study and this woman comes in and she's got an old King James water stained Bible. And I thought that has got to be a family heirloom. And I'm, I've got to hear the story of where that creature came from. I said, Hey, where did you get that? Is that like one a family members? Like, has that been passed down? Tell me about that. And she looked really confused and she said, um, is this the right book? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I've never been invited to a Bible study before. And I found this at Goodwill. Is this the right thing? Do I, is this what I need? I found this in the bargain bin for a dollar. And I was like, okay, you're going to give me that. And I'm going to give you a brand new one in the queen's English that you'll be able to understand. Yes. Give that, give that thing to me. Um, you know, I'm from Louisiana. If I start with the these and vows, my, my Southern accent will hang out very terribly. And um, it was apparent to me very early in ministry um, that women do not have the same access and that they won't engage with the dollar mission copies that people will give away. But if you give them a new gift Bible with journaling space and, and it's got devotionals in it and it's inviting um, you know, we have a, a partner at Hosanna Revival. Their Bibles are what we use. Um, man, beautiful, stunning Bibles. We give those to military spouses. And if, and if that is a $35 Bible and an investment, if, if you knew that $35 would gain you a soul, like, hey, listen, that's the best $35 we've ever spent. And so, you know, that's the second way is to fund us. Um, and really the third is to, is to know more about us and advocate for us. Um, not a lot of people know that there is an entire division of mission for the military community. Um, there are big ministries out there. Crew military has a great presence, cadence, the navigators, and they are focused on the service members and they do great things. Um, as far as the spouses, the options are much, much more limited um, and especially in raising up women as missionaries, um, we're kind of unique in our space. So getting to know us and, and sharing more about us. And the best way to do all three of those things is by downloading the app in uh, the Google Play uh, store or the Apple iStore. Do you have an idea for a podcast, but don't know where to start? Take our podcasting one-on-one -on -one course with Stephanie Roussel who shares with you her knowledge and tips to take your podcast from concept to reality. This three hour webinar is extremely practical and hands-on, providing you with the information that you need to start a podcast in just 30 days. Plus, the fee for this course is invested back to Gospel Spice, 
It's like your money gets multiplied. You get top-notch coaching by helping us spread the gospel. Go to gospelspice.com slash podcasting for the details. So if you're listening to this right now, I know that this is not the typical space that Gospel Spice goes into, but I would really, I cannot more strongly ask you to please consider checking out what Megan is doing. And um, I wish I could give you the $20,000 you need. I really wish I could. But I'm asking Gospel Spice listeners to consider giving a little something towards those $20,000 because um, I really believe that what you're doing is really unique. And yes, usually at Gospel Spice, we focus on the fight against human trafficking. And this is not what we usually focus on. But seriously, people, please listen to what Megan is doing. Um, Check it out. Give a little something of your time and your talents and your resources and see where it goes. And and Megan, I really cannot wait to see what 2023 is going to bring. Uh, again, I've had the privilege of having conversations with you for, I don't know, maybe a year or so. And I just, I can see the Lord at work. And I love that you are doing it uh, scared, as one of our favorite women, Jill Briscoe, often says. Um, yes, I love Jill You're Briscoe. doing it scared, but you're doing it. And that deserves our attention as the body of Christ. So um, Megan, we're going to put all the links in the, in the episode show notes so that people can reach out to you, but very quickly, just give us for those who are not going to check the show notes. uh, Where do we go right now? Follow us on social media at Millspoco. It's M I L S P O C O Millspoco. It's short for the military spouse coalition. Um, Millspoco is on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, You can find us at www.millspoco.com. But again, the best way to get us is in our app. There's a lot of media content. Um, You know, stay tuned. We will be launching a blog and a podcast in 23 as well. And we're going to be sharing more of the story um, in and through the app. Um, But that's really the best place to find us. It's such a cool place. You can set up recurring giving. You can set up notifications so that you can be the first to know what we need prayer for and over. Um, we really value our partners in ministry and that's the best place to catch us. So find us in the app. Absolutely. Let's just do that. Thank you, Megan. Um, Would you like to pray for our listeners before we end? Yes, I would love that. Thank you. Father God, thank you so much for this time that we could spend together talking more about what it looks like to be in the active duty military community. And Father, I pray um, over the gospel spice listeners as they are moving in and through their daily life and, and really asking you the same question. all of us are asking God, what would you have us do for you? Mm -hmm. I pray that you would give us courage, that you would give us your provision, that we would be 100% reliant upon the Holy spirit to move, to carry out your will in the lives of those who are listening. And in our lives, father, we thank you uh, that you have already mapped out the plan Um, We thank you that you are with us for every step of the way. And I ask God that if there's someone in the audience that you're calling to do something for you, that you would make the calling unequivocally clear, that you would show them what it is they're supposed to be doing and when, that you would give them boldness, that you would give them encouragement, that you would give them the strength. Father, I thank you that you do all of this for us and more in Jesus. I pray for Stephanie as she continues to uh, lead well at Gospel Spice, and and we thank you for the for the reach that you've given her, and for the encouragement she gives an entire community of people. We thank you for the ability to use our hands, our voices, our hearts, for the mission and purpose of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And please know that I keep on praying for you on a daily basis, my friend. It's an honor to know you and to love you. Thank you. Love you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Merci. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you are the first to know when we release a new video or episode. Also, would you please consider helping us reach new people with the good news of the spice of the gospel by leaving a five-star review for the Gospel Spice podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, etc. Finally, share and follow us on social media to spread the word of Gospel Spice. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to tune in our podcast with you episodes every Friday. I'll see you in our next video very soon right here. Merci.